And um, we have Liam, Liam O'Brien, who you saw his bio. We've been having lovely talks on the phone. <laughs> We have, we we're, have. We're both border collies, so it's very interesting. <laughs> Two border collies in search of something to corral. And um, what I love about Liam, not only that he's very entertaining, is he has opinions. And, and we may, I mean all of us, right? I got opinions too. And you may not agree with my opinion, but I really appreciate people who have a position, stick to their position, and say what their opinion is. It's really good. I mean, just like we need diversity in our garden, we need a diversity of ideas as well. So I think you will find Liam both entertaining and informative. So please welcome Liam O'Brien. Wow, that's quite the intro. Um, So I'll just wait for folks to. In Australia, they call this checkers. Checkers means take your seat. Checkers, checkers. Well, um, first of all, I want to thank, if she has not been thanked ad nauseum here, our wonderful coordinator here. She requested some technical things, which of course, being a child of the 70s, I had to go to the Apple store and get advice from the 14-year-old salesman. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to press. Um, okay. Also, um, Nancy, who picked me up from the uh, train. A big round of applause. Thank you, Nancy. I think I've stopped at every stop along the Caltrans for different talks. I live in San Francisco and I don't have a car, so. Oh, it's, no, I miss my car. It's not PC. I, uh, it's just parking hell there. You don't want a car. Okay, hi, my name is Liam O'Brien. Um, somehow I have become uh, a lepidopterist. <laughs> Everyone say lepidopterist. Lepidopterist. It's a fun word once you say it because of that PT part, dopt. We don't have a lot of those in English. And as simply put, it's the study of, so lepidopter means scaled wings. If you were a coleopterist, you'd be a beetle person. So, scaled wings, lepidoptera. Um, okay, here we go. So, uh, we could, so I was living with, uh, my brother was Sean, other brother Colin, sister Siobhan, we're a little Irish. Um, I was living with Sean, he was going through a divorce, and I was sort of co-raising uh, Miranda, my niece, who actually left this weekend for UC Santa Barbara. It's her college, I changed her diapers, and now she's in college. But I used to say, now Miranda, who are the only gods that Uncle Liam prays to? And this little toddler would look up and she'd go, Parking! <laughs> and PowerPoint presentations! <laughs> and my brother Sean would just like, Dude, why did you do that? I'd say, because that's funny. That's funny. PowerPoint presentations. So, the god of PowerPoint has shined upon us. And thanks for all the tech work there. Okay, so who the heck am I? <laughs> yeah, I came by this by, as I got into the Union of Acting when I was 20. I performed in many repertory theaters all over the country. Ultimately, I did Les Miserables for three years on Broadway. That's uh, doing Thenardier. And the girl there is Lea Salonga, who won the Tony Award for Miss Saigon. She, she had come in to do Eponine. So, that, wow, how am I where I am now? And this is sort of surreal, because I'm sort of in a theater, right? <laughs> There's no orchestra pit, though. Okay, so, yeah, that's, is that a blank one? I think you hit the wrong button. It's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my god, the gods of PowerPoint totally cursed me, right? Okay, which one should I not touch? You need a genus bar t-shirt. Okay. Okay. So, I was hired uh, by American Conservatory Theater to replace the lead in Angels in America. I played prior for the rest of the run there at the Marines Memorial. 
They flew me out. They put me up in a little uh, apartment in the DeBose Triangle of San Francisco, just looking out the door, and boom, this thing floats into the backyard. This is Papilio rudilis. I will use common names as well, the Western Tiger, and uh, went down. You know, it's only in retrospect, you look back at your life and you're like, wow, my whole life changed utterly in that dime. Uh, went down, uh, started um, enthralled, I think it was on a Cosmos, and just paint. And I went upstairs and I grabbed some paper. I used to paint and draw a lot when I was younger, but theater, there's kind of no time for it. And uh, like my little brother Colin says, you know, I don't do anything half. Um, so... <laughs> I went and bought a used field guide. I know I need to work over here. Uh, field guide, uh, joined the Lepidopterist Society, I think within a week. Uh, and uh, I hawked a bunch of Thomas Hardy novels so I could go on my first butterfly count up on the Sonora Pass. Uh, so that's where the mania started. And um, I, in all due respect, I want to admit, uh, it's because it's like a 12-step nature class here, uh, I began collecting uh, because, and again, we can talk about that later. Uh, I think it's a little bit sad that the collecting has become so politically incorrect. It's, it's a known thing that anyone who goes into entomology, whether boy or girl, and whatever thing they go off into, they, most people begin with a butterfly collection. It's a little wackadoodle to apply vertebrate mortality to invertebrate mortality. So, and it, you know, the Voltairean ideal of children running with butterfly nets, you just don't see it anymore. That's a shame E.O. Wilson started with the <laughs> butterfly count. So I just want to throw that out. We can talk about that later. Uh, but I paint and illustrate, so I sort of justified it in my own spin zone. That I'm like, well, they have better use than... Anyway, uh, so I also like to throw this shot in here. This is at the Hastings Reserve in Carmel Valley. I was doing the Hastings Butterfly Count. And I like to show this because the net is not an instrument of death. The, the net is a multi-purpose field tool, just like your friggin' binoculars. And this is no joke, someone took me, the deer flies were eating me alive. So again, multi, not an instrument of death. Most butterflying is catch and release anyway, so I just want to shout out to that. You all can run out and buy nets tomorrow. But um, anyway, so this, um, I started keeping a pretty intense field journal. This is a page of mine, and the Lep Society started to print and, and publish my stuff. I had an acting teacher in college once who saw some of my paintings and drawings, and he said, that worries me. And I'm like, why? And he goes, because that's the opposite of theater. Painting and drawing is isolated and alone. Theater is utterly collaborative. So there are some weird bipolar things going on in me. For... But I'm highly medicated, so we're OK. Uh, so this is what I do. I like to, you know, I love a field guide. I need a 12-step class for all the books out in that alley there. Uh, and I like to put the creature back into the habitat and sort of paint the entire, this is Mona Pass. I joined, thank God the Lepidoptera Society is so embracing of the amateur. <laughs> so listen to this, in the, ten, in the manifesto, 1934, the Lepidoptera Society wrote, quote, we make no distinction between the amateur and the academic. We know one needs the other to move this along. Talk, I mean, they're, you know, 70 years before citizen science. So think about that. And it's very true. So I ran around slaughtering my Latin with the boys of Berkeley, and uh, they put up with it for a while. And then, <laughs> so I just, uh, they started printing my uh, uh, journals. Uh, this was a night out there at Lake Pena Blanca. I started with silk moths and sort of the deep end. I hope all of you, before you leave the planet Earth, can stand at a moth sheet just one night because it'll blow your mind. Um, a little factoid here as we move along. Uh, uh, this will sort of put, we all love butterflies. I'm here to talk about butterflies. They're beautiful. Our species likes beauty. But this will give you the stat here. Uh, approximately 750 butterfly species, approximately, in the continental United States, Hawaii and Alaska. I guess that's not the continent. 
Um, 350,000 moths. So butterflies really, folks, are just a day-flying niche of the order of Lepidoptera. The story of Lepidoptera are moths, even though they're kind of little brown, kind of plain looking things, but you're not really taken seriously till you step up to your moths. So, uh, but yeah, it's true. And then they're shouting the Latin out and I'm like, okay, where are the butterflies? So um, I, uh, these are some silk moths, beautiful night. It was a uh, really beautiful spinged moths there, the hawk moths. Anyway, just sort of giving you my background here. And then uh, I was fortunate enough to be someone who just got around, and now I have a full-time job painting trail signs for the city of San Francisco. And I'm lucky enough that they let me incorporate my lepidoptic knowledge there. This is a sign that went in up on Twin Peaks. Uh, sorry, Strawberry Hill, the island that's in the middle of Stowe Lake in Golden Gate Park. We'll talk about hilltopping in a while, but this is a really great place. You can actually see the things that are on the sign all around you. So, um, and then, uh, God, it's like, a, my, I feel like I'm QVC. Um, so then I was hired. I, my first book was for the Presidio Trust. I painted for three years in the Presidio, and uh, they published my book. You can get this later. And then, um, okay, really, we will get to it. So, San Francisco, great. What a crud hole for butterflies. What, <laughs> great. I love butterflies and I live in a highly dense urban place. So, uh, I'm not the first person to notice this. There's a quote here from um, Paul Ehrlich, the famous populationist, who used checker spots as his model for population. He said, quote, telling numbers can be gleaned from the city and county of San Francisco. Of the 46 species recorded there before the 20th century, 21 have been lost. So actually, what's happened, folks, is that, quote, we are more famous in San Francisco for what no longer flies than for what flies. And it's mainly because of this creature right here. This is Glacocyche xerxes, the xerxes blue. Uh, flew all over San Francisco. And in the Victorian era of collecting, which was actually primarily a female hobby thing. There's kind of fascinating history there. Um, everybody wanted the polka-dotted butterfly from the hills of San Francisco, as you can see. So in the blue group, boys are usually electric blue, solidly blue from above, and the girls are sort of the slate brown blue. But that's the underside of both of them. And that really was the Willy Wonka gold ticket of collecting in the United States. So I, as much as I am an advocate not an advocate, but collecting has its place still. This is one of the few that probably collecting did have an impact, but then it became highly urbanized, and the last one was caught uh, near the old hospital in the Presidio, 1946. The gentleman who just, who caught it, he's late 80s now, and he, he just died, but he hated that he knew, everyone's like, he caught the last one. And uh, first butterfly, in the world to be removed from the planet Earth due to human encroachment and development. So that's, that's San Francisco, the Xerxes Blue. Now we have a wonderful conservation society, the Xerxes Society, named after this butterfly, and we've done a lot for invertebrates since Xerxes. But again, I go to, <laughs> go to national LEPSOC meetings, Liam O'Brien, San Francisco County, and they're, oh, San Francisco. <laughs> and it's true. So we have this odd, dubious cloud of um, Xerxes. A lot of my work, I'm trying desperately to get us known for what actually still is there. So, okay, this is going to be cool because I'm with plant people and you guys actually might know. Does anyone know who this is? Barbara Deutsch. <laughs> right on. So Barbara Deutsch, uh, one of the goddesses of Lepidoptera in San Francisco. A lot of people don't realize this, but it is Barbara Deutsch who threw a Molotov cocktail into the CNPS in the late 60s, and she said, which blew people's minds, why don't you put the plants that the butterflies can eat in your garden? You mean not just pretty things? What are you talking about? She literally wrote an article, and that is the goddess that Barbara Deutsch is. So uh, I told her I had this sort of idea, and she's been a, a big champion of mine, 
The butterfly on her nose right there is Lorquin's admiral, uh, Leannis Lorquini. San Francisco again. We are world famous because of the butterfly, the man that that butterfly is named after, Pierre Lorquin. He came to San Francisco in the gold rush. A Frenchman was looking for gold, but he brought his butterfly net. And he walked up probably Market Street all the way to the top and collected, sent them back to a gentleman named Bois de Val. And that is why San Francisco has 13 type specimens because of Pierre Lorquin, the name Lorquin's admiral. However, that butterfly does not fly in San Francisco, so there's some weird irony there. So uh, this is a page of my journal. I told Barbara, I want to collect. I want to see what's left in San Francisco. This is about 207. Theater was sort of winding down. I had a very successful career. Uh, you know, I had a lot of success. Uh, I had skill, I had studied, I knew what to do, but I never ever had drive as an actor. And you can't live in New York. I got the job on Broadway nine days after landing on that island, and that's ridiculous. So I acknowledge a lot of it was luck, but something happened when Butterfly sort of entered my world that I sort of had wind back in the passion of uh, something. So I told Barbara, I want to survey San Francisco. I want to see what's left. And it's because Jerry Powell, who's god of L Little Brown Apple Moth, retired professor at uh, Berkeley, he said, um, learn where you live. I'm like, yeah, I live in San Francisco. Yeah, a bunch of vacant lots. So uh, that's what I did. And I set out because Barbara Deutsch said, quote, green hair streaks still fly in the sunset. So I set out, this is the hair, this is, I'm scared of pressing the wrong button here, so I'll use mine. Uh, so this is the Glen, Glen, uh, Grandview Terrace in the upper sunset. Uh, there's a bunch of hills along here called the San Miguel Range. From the top of the Grandview Terrace down to Ocean Beach, all the way through that, that is the largest contiguous upland dune in North America from top to bottom. Of course, there's all houses there now, but um, pretty special place. So I went out looking for it, uh, couldn't find it, so I was painting a wallflower there, I think. And then, boom, I found it. There it is. Uh, the pictures get better, I promise. <laughs> this is Califris viridis, and I'm like, wow, it's still there. Uh, about the size of a dime, it's in the Lysenid group, and it's an emerald green little nickel-sized butterfly. Um, however, San Francisco is a pretty intense place for butterflies. Um, we will talk about that. But then I read another thing in the California Insects book, and he says, sometimes something sinister is happening to California butterflies. If one returns to a locality in which a butterfly was found 50, 25, or even 10 years ago, it may not be found there now. If the area has remained unaltered by man, the chances of still finding the butterfly are most likely very good. But if man has uh, intervened, moved in, built houses, factories, highways, or farms, I love that they were worried about building farms in San Francisco. Uh, if indeed it can be found at all. So that was written in 1986, and here's this little green butterfly holding on in this neighborhood. So again, I, it was sort of my Waterloo, it was sort of my um, barricades fighting in Les Mis that this was my call to arms. I was going to go find what was left in San Francisco. I'm going to trespass, I'm going to comb every vacant lot, every open area. I wanted to see what was left in San Francisco. So why we have named this talk, you know, how does San Francisco relate to my backyard? It really does because a lot of people get very overwhelmed when they take on a new group of creatures, right? I think it's always funny when the birders say to me, man, I'm going to really step up to my butterflies next year. And, okay, there's 300 birds and 35 butterflies. I think you can do it. So, uh, but like all of us, and I'm snarky, but I understand, it turns out with only 35 species, it becomes quite doable. We've got examples of each. You're not going to go out and buy a field guide and go, oh, what's in my backyard, you know? So uh, I kind of filled a niche there, and we'll talk about that. OK, so kids, this is going to be a little, it's going to be focused on butterflies. And we're going to go through the five families, just five. Don't worry. It's really easy. I'll help you with the Latin. And. Um, 
All right, so first off, what is a host plant? For anyone who can read the thing behind me on the wall. <laughs> people get very confused here, and I'm with plant people. I'm so happy. Okay, so <laughs> host plant, not that complicated, folks. Just remember, it's the plant or family of plants the female lays her eggs on. Female butterflies are generalists in families of plants for egg laying. Generalists. Well, no, specifists, sorry. <laughs> they, they need the family of plants. So we've got checkered skippers in San Francisco that use Sildacea, the mallow, our only native checker bloom. But then cheeseweed moves into every vacant lot, Malvo parvifolia, and now she is laying eggs year round because of the new option of mallow. Would I ever tell you to plant cheeseweed? Of course not. But it's good to know when you're shopping and trying to put together your garden that she's a generalist in a family of plants. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna start, don't be scared, and these guys all live in the Bay Area. The, most of them will visit your backyard. So let's start with the uh, swallowtails, the largest group. Everyone knows that big floaty thing that comes over your fence. They're sort of uh, the turkey vultures of the just, they ride the thermals in and out. They thermal regulate between shade and sun. And uh, this is one of our more famous ones. This is um, Batsus phylonor, the California pipevine swallowtail. This creature is obligated to only one plant. This is the beautiful underside of uh, anybody. Everybody has seen this butterfly. The boy's sort of a gunmetal blue. She's kind of a dusky brown. And they like to come to yellow, uh, red flowers. That's, of course, and we will get to that. But the reason the butterfly is here because of this plant, Aristolochia californica, Dutchman's pipe vine. Fascinating little story about that plant is that any butterfly that uses a vine, you're going to hear about Gulf fritillaries in a while, but anything that uses a vine is a jungle holdover. This creature, uh, when, Arist when this was all jungle, Aristolochia is it found in at 46 of the states. It covers the nation, this plant. So um, it bombs around really fast, and it finds the vine. And I can't stress enough when people ask me what to put into their yards, this is a huge one, because somehow she really does find the Aristolochia in people's backyards. It's a tough one to plant, but Jake Sig from Europe, when everybody knows Jake, he says, get the vine, wrap it in a circle, tie little bread things around it, you know, you make a circle and plant the whole circle. And then you get the vine coming up. And then you'll have to buy a machete in five years to keep it in control. But you'll get pipe vine swallowtails in your yard. Uh, we're gonna blast through a lot of these too, because you see I'm sort of a chatty boy. Um, now, this is an interesting thing. So everybody thinks that butterflies are just sort of this random thing happening. They float over here, they're into your garden. Pretty flowers, pretty butterflies. But the cool thing is when you step up to your Lepidoptera and you learn that there's a lot of very specific behavior going on with butterflies. And one of them is this phenomenon. Does anybody know what's happening there? Wow, I'm with plant people, I'm so happy. <laughs> That's right, mud puddling. So, what's going on here, you'll go to the Sierras, you will see tons of little blue butterflies along the side of the path. What's happening there is that these are all boys, only males mud puddle. And I want you to start thinking about your gardens, how important wet, open mud is to a butterfly. Barbara has this amazing fountain in her garden up in Point Reyes Station that it's sort of a trickle over a rock and then it kind of hits a seep. It's not a fountain shooting. It's like a wet, boggy area. Very good for wildlife, as you probably all know. He is pulling out salts and minerals from the earth because male butterflies are not born with the ability to procreate. They have to go to wet mud, sort of like you see like Parrots will go to a salt lick or stuff like that. The same thing is happening with butterflies to create spermatophore pockets for the group for, um, well, you know. <laughs> so, um, and there's no children here, are there? Okay. <laughs> Gotta watch the potty mouth. 
Okay, so mud puddling. It's a really neat phenomenon, and it's only boys that do that. You will never see girls there. The other weird thing about mud puddling in the Sierras is that you'll see Bordeval's blue come in or a pale tiger. They will fly all past the other ones, and they'll only sit in mud with their own kind. <laughs> and we don't know why they do that. There's really no need for that. I guess it's like safety in numbers, but it's so weird. Like, okay, blues, blues, okay, here's the pale tigers. And it, they always do that. So that's sort of a neat thing. They're still trying to figure out what's going on. I doubt you'll have that problem in your yard. Okay, western tiger. I'm going to shoot past this because it's kind of, this is the one that sort of rocked my world. Large creature, yellow. We have five swallowtails in the Bay Area. We have the largest swallowtail in the United States. A lot of people don't realize that, but go for a walk in Mitchell's Canyon in Mount Diablo, and you'll see Papilio multicatata, the two-tailed tiger swallowtail. She lays her eggs on hop, which I guess it's myopis or you know, hop plant, hop tree. And it has a limited range in the Bay Area, hence the butterfly has the limited range. That's her host. But the Western Tiger, which has these long stripes, um, is doing an amazing thing right now. So one of the things that has happened in my wackadoodle life is that I'm a conservationist now. And I have these ideas for, it turns out San Francisco is such this cruddy place for butterflies, but I got these weird ideas about what we can do for some of these things that are living in San Francisco. So one of the weirder things is that the Western Tiger Swallowtail is a riparian obligate. She lays her eggs on deciduous hardwoods, which like cotton, elm, one of the few butterflies that host on a tree. That butterfly patrols long linear concourses <laughs> called rivers or creeks. It's a riparian, the boys patrol, and they're following the female pheromones up in the canopy. You'll see them just sort of floating. That, so a long linear corridor. It also, like a creek, it likes plantings on both sides of the long linear corridor. One of the plants she will lay her egg on are sycamore. They think what's happening with, with Western Tiger is that and it's evolved at the larval stage that if it falls out of a cottonwood tree, it can walk over and crawl up and eat the elm tree, or it can eat the salix willow, or so it's a, it can eat a lot of trees, interesting. The most famous widespread urban tree, anybody know this one? What, oh, she gets the prize. This is the London plane tree, it's the most widespread urban planted tree in the world. 80% of all trees in London on the streets are London plane trees. It's a hybrid, it was created when the English botanists came over to the New World. They found our American sycamore, they brought it back and they hybridized it to the oriental sycamore, and you ended up with the London plane tree. So, we've got a long linear concourse with plantings on both sides, and her host tree lines the streets. If anyone doesn't know, this is Market Street in San Francisco. So, one of my projects right now is Tigers on Market. Connecting people to this unbelievable thing that's happening, and, and I try to stay away from the word adapting, because it sort of connotes a biological change, but here I am telling so many sad stories of we're destroying habitat and where these things are holding on in our native areas, and then there's this jaw-dropping story of this, our biggest showiest butterfly floating over traffic. It's quite something, so I'm working with the city. We're gonna try to, it, that whole street's gonna be ripped up and reconnoitered, they want it to be. It's a little scary down there at 3 a.m. And uh, so Tigers on Market Street, it's kind of been, we've been handed this amazing, connecting people in a non-native area to wildlife. It's quite the vogue and restoration right now. A lot of big countries are sitting, yeah, it's kind of cool. So, okay, the Western Tiger. Okay, now this is the other yellow butterfly that comes to your gardens. This is the Anna's Swallowtail, Papilio zelicaon. And note the black shoulders. People are like, oh, I know there's two tiger swallowtails, but they're both yellow. We're not, uh. and I'm like, okay, well, welcome to yellow, yellow Swallowtail 101. There's only two. So this is what I always tell folks. Black shoulders versus black stripes. 
And you can really see the shoulders of the Anna Swallowtail when it's flying. So this is a very interesting story too, is that the native for the Anna Swallowtail, she's a generalist in the carrot family. She will lay her eggs on, in your yard, of course, you know, I would throw after um, hog fennel or lamatium. She will do parsley, she'll do carrots, she'll do a lot of things. But they've shown this even in laboratory that when fennel moved into town, uh, even in laboratory at UC Davis, they've done an experiment where they'll have fennel over here and they'll have all of her native ones over here. 97% she flies in and goes straight to the fennel. So this is the thing. I, you would never plant fennel. In fact, any time that I'm going to be talking a butterfly story, you really have to understand the aggressive non-native plant story always trumps the butterfly story. We don't need to help the Anna Swallowtail. It's doing fine. And of course, need I tell you, because you're all plant people, fennel, my god, I mean, if we don't do something, it will just slowly take over everything, right? So why I tell that is because Robert Michael Pyle, the god of American butterflying, and he founded the Xerxes Society, he says, don't be afraid of telling the whole story. You know, uh, and that has a lot to do with my work, is that we seem to, we've projected a lot onto butterflies. Why? Because they're really pretty. Pretty makes us kind of cuckoo, really does. I'm like, uh, hey, you know, emails, Liam, I've got 14 Anna Swallowtails in a cup, I'm overwintering them, and then I'm gonna let them go. I'm like, okay, well, you're starving some birds in the world, so where are you helping? I, and I, again, it sounds snarky, but we do like to help, and so a lot of the work, I think it's because of my background as an actor, I'm as equally enthralled in our relationship to nature as I am the nature itself. And I think I like to just sort of throw things up there. Um, I was at, you're kidding. You said you wanted early notice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how much time do I have to go, Mr. Chen? You have a lot of time. Oh, okay. But <coughs> Move it along. Yes, yeah, so you, you wanted. <laughs> That's okay. tell you at Seriously, you see, I, I need a director like that, okay. So uh, now we are into a new family, the Pierrots, the Whites and the Sulfurs. This is the Cabbage White. It's a, it's a non-native that was introduced through Quebec in 1890. She's a generalist in the mustards. Fascinatingly enough, she, this non-native exotic butterfly, is now using its host, wild radish, which is also an exotic, so we have the exotic English butterfly and the exotic host plant doing the thing that they do in England. So that's kind of interesting. But uh, it's one of the easier butterflies. You can impress people because you can actually sex this butterfly. The male only has one white dot and the female has two. So that's a cool party trick you can impress your friends in the yard. In general, butterflies are sexually dimorphic like humans. Males and females look different, and that's a tough one when you're learning your butterflies because you think, okay, I know that that's a myletic crescent, and then this other thing flies by, and it's the female of the myletic crescent, but you're like, what is that? That must be a different species, so just know that. But when they're not dimorphic, like the tiger swallowtail, the girls are always bigger because they're carrying the eggs. <laughs> Getting all this, kids? Okay, so this is a white butterfly that a lot of folks dismiss. This is my cruddy picture, but this is the better picture. Not all white butterflies are cabbage whites. I'm like, yeah. So this is a native. This is Eucloia sonides, the large marble. And uh, she hosts on our beautiful native wild uh, rock cress. So that's a kind of a, a beautiful, get some rock cress into your yard if you can. She will show up. They're all over the Bay Area. But a lot of people don't realize it because it's, it's a white butterfly, so it's kind of cool. So here's the orange sulfur. Uh, this one, here's the, so this is kind of cool. Most butterflies, when they land on a flower and the wings are open, it's called dorsal basking, which means you're looking down at the top of the butterfly. So there's a group of butterflies that laterally bask. They never drop their wings, and you're only seeing the underside of the butterfly. This is the orange sulfur. This is the one that hits your windshield when you're driving past UC Davis because they're also in the alfalfa fields. 
The female has these window panes in the black bar on the forewing, and you can't really see it here, but the boy has a solid black bar. Sarah Orange Tip is a really obscure one that I saw in San Francisco. I'm just gonna power through some of these. Okay, so folks, we're past two families. This is easy, right? So now we're to the largest group, Nymphalidae. Everyone say the Nymphalids. Nymphalids. Those are the brush foots. Those are the main ones that you guys are gonna see in your yard, the painted ladies. They're all about medium size and um, I made this field guide. I think I'm gonna have it. Here's the California tortoiseshell. This is the satyr anglewing. This hosts on stinging nettle. When I, uh, I walked through the Golden Gate Park and you know I was hired to help with butterfly habitat stuff and I'm like, stinging nettle, we need more stinging nettle. And she's like, Liam, I got people walking paths. So I can't really have stinging nettle. On. But uh, so that's a beauty. That one will come to your yard. Everybody must know this guy, the Red Admiral. Start to learn these patterns and you'll be able to get going on it. This butterfly also used to only fly in the spring uh, and lay its eggs on stinging nettle. And then something moved into every sidewalk crack in San Francisco, everywhere, pellitory. Yes. Know that little mint? We would never plant pellitory for the butterfly but don't be afraid of telling the story. And now, smart girl, she lays her eggs 12 months a year because of the new non-native choice in the sidewalk. So that's one way of looking at it. You know, she's got to find things for eggs. Now, of course, you'd never plant pellitory, but that is occurring in the urban setting. Okay, this one will blow your mind and I really will power through this. And you're like, oh no, painted ladies. Vanessa Cardoi. Vanessa Annabella, named Edwards named it after his daughter, Annabella. Vanessa Virginiensis. You're like, what? Aren't those all the same? You're like, no, welcome to Vanessa 101. Uh, and again, this is sort of advanced. If you really stick with this, guys, you really will learn these things. I'm not gonna take you through all of this, but there's three of them. It all is based to do, it's called the four-wing disc cell there. White, orange, white. So the second you see orange, you're at Annabella. And then there's some other ones, you start to learn the scalpeling and stuff, but these are three separate species that fly in the Bay Area. They'll all land and lay their eggs on your natives. I heard it, I heard it. Good, it's a great one to learn. Most people do learn this rather quickly because of its unique, nobody else looks like the Buckeye. Its native is Plantago erecta, our little baby plantain. And then English plantain moved into town, Plantago lanceolata. Flies now 12 months a year because of the non-native plant. This makes people nervous here. But if you learn some of these weeds that you all drink your coffee and meticulously get out there and pull out every weed, if you learn some of them, some of the nephilim, some of the cheese weeds, some of this, you're actually gonna be creating a better butterfly garden. I get emails, this guy goes, I saw, I saw a Virginiensis laying her eggs on the Nephilim in the sidewalk and that worries me. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I just think those things are kind of funny. You know, I'm gonna pull all that out and put in the right one for her. <laughs> wow. Anyway, snarky but funny, huh? It's kind of funny. Okay. This one I will go fast on, but again, I love these stories. And there's only 34 in the Bay Area in San Francisco, and this will really help you. We, we don't have about 50 surrounding the Bay. Agrillus vanillae. This is the Gulf fritillary. I have a feeling this has bombed through everyone's garden because it uses passion vine, passiflora. It's the vine. It's the other vine butterfly. Listen to this story. When all things tropical started to go into people's gardens in Southern California, calla lilies, canna lilies, Tropicana Hollywood, one of the plants that everyone put in their garden, Passiflora, which passion vine is not native to California. We have no native passion vine. This butterfly hopped along as this vine was put into people's backyards. We get the non-native, it's our only non-native butterfly on a non-native plant. 
we can't say that about the cabotrite because we have towns, we have tower mustard, so she could be using that one, the cabbage. But this girl, unless there's passion vine, there is no gulf frit. This thing bombs around like a jet in San Francisco. It's just really taken to it. However, it can't survive a freeze, so it's pushing its northerly area, but we don't really have weather anymore here in San Francisco, California, so this butterfly is now found up around the Oregon border. It's an amazing, it's a real indicator of how the climate is changing, because this is a jungle creature. Interesting. So, of course it's not a native, but it's pretty, and if you want this butterfly, you'll need some passion vine on the fence, and you'll need that machete as well, right? It also will go for the passion fruit, too, to put uh, her eggs on the fruiting one as well. But um, this is one of my favorite things. So people have to understand, and this is going to be one of the bombs I'm going to throw at you right now. Everybody put their seatbelts on. Are butterflies pollinators? <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> butterflies are not pollinators. <laughs> and I have teachers that are like, what? So folks, I can guarantee you that you go home and look at any butterfly in your garden any one of them, and you won't see any pollen on this creature. Butterflies are not built to pollinate. They have long, attenuated legs, they have their proboscis out, and they're standing there, and they are nectaring. They're opportunistically going to your flower to nectar. But when butterfly gardening got going in the 80s and stuff, we projected that on. We like pretty going to pretty flower. We're helping the environment because we have pretty butterflies on pretty flowers. Folks, the bees, the gnats, the, the flies, they're the moths, robust thorax down into the flower. They're the pollinators. But we don't take our kids to fly world. <laughs> right? We don't. Honey, let's go to, they're having an exhibit at Mothland. And, and again, I'm sort of snarky, but that is what's happening. When I started the Green Hair Streak Project, this little green butterfly, and we'll power through that in a second. But um, there's a clock up there. No, no, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm watching. You're going. Okay. <laughs> when I started the Green Hair Streak Project, because I got this idea on how we could help save this butterfly in the, in the San Francisco, I was talked to Lorette Rogers, who runs the Bay Institute. And I had no background in conservation. I just had this wacky idea of flooding the neighborhood with Ariadnum latifolium, <laughs> handing it out and giving it out. She says, a green butterfly. You've got a green butterfly. She goes, I'm trying to get people excited about mud snails, and you've got a green butterfly. And I get it. She goes, that's like having a panda walking around in the neighborhood. And I get it. I get it. And why do I get it? Because we like pretty. We like to help pretty. Don't have a lot of things for, like, noctuid moths. You know, we, we don't. It's an interesting thing in our species, how we help pretty. So, um... This is a great moment. So I will go quick here, too. In her brief 10 days, 10 to 12 days, on average, the female lives. She's an egg-laying machine. She lays 80 eggs. 80% 80 of all the eggs that are laid on the host plant, 80%, eaten, eaten by everyone else on the plant, all the other insects. 80% of the 20% that get to the caterpillar or larval stage, 80% of those, of the 20%, parasitized by native wasps and flies that they have co-evolved with. Caterpillar will walk along. Fully formed fly will crawl right out of his side in four days. They have co-evolved with parasites. 80% of the 20% of the 80% of the 20% that get to the pupa stage. Guess what's going on in that pretty little chrysalis there in the classroom? It's a big juicy factory of nothing because of parasites in there eating away at it. 80% of the 20% of the 80% of the 20% of the 80% of the 20% that become this butterfly, the adult. And it's weird. There's a great word that we don't really use anymore. We have ova, larva, pupa, and then we say butterfly. It's all butterfly. But the imago, isn't that great? It's a great Scrabble word. I-M-A-G-O. We just don't use it. 80% of all butterflies on the wing, this phase that we all love and cherish and adore, 80% eaten by birds and spiders. Folks, butterflies are 
a movable feast for everyone else. They're not pollinating. <laughs> now, I have a lot of teachers that get upset. Most entomologists know this, but um, like, what do you mean? I've got 90 lessons for the kids and the pollinators. And, you know, I have to watch my phrasing, but it's like, look, we need to teach the kids it's noble to be eaten. I mean, <laughs> that has its place, right? So I like to always shatter that one. You'll go home, and you'll also have a whole new appreciation when you see that thing flying <laughs> over your fence to what it took to get to that. And so that's, that's a real big takeaway. Uh, you're feeding everybody else, and it's okay that they're eaten. Okay, it's been entertaining, right? Okay, so I do want to go back here. So I'm such a freak that, let me walk you through this. This is an orb weave spider. They come out in August. You know, we sort of see those pumpkin spiders. Um, uh, he's got a wrapped up female up there in the top right. She's emanating pheromones to call the boy in. Butterflies deal in close range pheromone exchange. Moths are long range pheromone exchange. In comes, oh, I did it again. In comes the boy because he's being called by her wrapped up dying pheromones. And this guy has his foot on the dead girl wrapped up and he's trying to pull in the boy who's trying to have sex with this one up here. I just watch them, I'm like, oh my god, I mean, it's just, that's kind of amazing. It just sort of takes your breath away what's going on in your yard. Okay, Euphidrius chalcedon, the variable checker spot. Interestingly enough, I've just been hired, my latest project for the Presidio, Operation Checker Spot. The butterfly once flew in the Presidio until 1974. This is one of the few butterflies, and I would never say this of any other one, that has not mixed well with traffic. Euphidrius chalcedon, which is the most widespread butterfly in California, the most abundant, even more than a cabbage white. When she's grabbing and full of eggs, she's kind of walking down the trail in the Sierras. The boys fly right about that bumper height. This has become isolated. The Presidio has created contiguous coastal scrub habitat. She's a coastal scrub obligate laying her eggs on Sticky Monkey. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Scrofularia, scrofs. Uh, the bee plant, and then uh, the parasite, the paintbrush. Should, they will eat anything of those. So I just wanted to throw that out. That I'm, that's a big project for me. These are only trapped in Laguna Honda. Behind, there's the host, uh, Euphidrius chalcedon. It's quite a pretty butterfly. Disney money came in. They're like, Liam, do you have any ideas for a project? <coughs> And they always, you know, we'll get to the monarch, but I want to help the monarch. I mean, there's other butterflies we can help here, kids. So, uh, there's, so they do an interesting thing as caterpillars, which is unique. It's called a gregarious cluster. All they, they all hang out together, they eat together, they sleep together, and then through as they molt, they disappear. But most butterflies, are, an egg is laid, and the caterpillar lives alone. But this group, they all sort of hang out. From below, it's got a beautiful red checkerboard. Okay, so this is another thing I want to point out for your gardens. Butterflies use flowers in many ways, folks, not just nectaring. And as I've said about nectar sources, if a butterfly is going down the I-5 of life, it makes no distinction between Wendy's on the left and Whole Earth Foods on the right. <laughs> Got to be a little cuckoo about our native flowers. Like, oh, I want it. It's not on the native flower. It's like, this is, folks, this is an opportunistic insect. That I've seen Anna Swallowtails hunkered down on a dandelion in the lawn. This is, creature needs nectar. It can use other things, flowers. They don't need to be native. But the natives are the ones you want for the host plants. I hope that's clear. But the other thing they do is that they use, butterflies use flowers as sex platforms. She's emanating pheromones, the girl in front, and he lands from behind waiting to receive her reception. <laughs> <laughs> I have to watch it when there's a kid in the audience. Like, okay, watch them out. Uh, this is Myletta checker spot. The other was field crescent. Field crescent lays her eggs on. A big one I always do is California aster, or the, um, she's a generalist in the aster family. So. 
I know that genus has been changed, but it's, I think it's Chiliensis or yes. our native. Get that in your yard. That's a really important plant for your yard for butterflies. Okay, California sister. This is an oak obligate. Of course, we all don't have time. We don't all have oaks in our backyard, but this is one that you will see in the oak community, sort of in the canopy. She lays her eggs on Quercus. What is that butterfly doing there? Mud puddling, that's right. You can be all experts by the time you leave here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Danaeus plexippus. Good, I'm, I need that. Um, thank God this creature has its own season. Because I couldn't handle all the emails I get on Danaeus plexippus. Uh, monarch. Big, showy, gorgeous. It's usually the gateway drug into butterflies for all of us. Because <laughs> it's big and pretty. And we like big and pretty. So, uh, Danaeus plexippus, it's our only migrant. It makes four generations. I'm not going to, I could do a whole show on these, and I'm sure you've all been to monarch shows. Um, stunning butterfly. Anybody know its host? You should, you all have drawers of the seeds at home. <laughs> so this is the problem. <laughs> this is the easy conservation thing. We let kids, we, okay, there's a caterpillar and all is well in the land on the milkweed. From San Mateo, about mid-San Mateo, I don't know where, where Asclepius sort of stops, but about right around here, maybe south, all the way to the tip of the Golden Gate, Asclepius has never been part of the dune ecosystem. But this was the poster child for all butterfly gardening in the early 80s when that mania got going. And everybody put in Tiberosa or showy milkweed. Folks, <laughs> please go home and pull it out. And replace it with the native Asclepius that's in your area. It turns out that that plant is holding more parasites and it's quite detrimental to this creature. And then this is the tough thing to wrap your brain around, but in San Francisco, and I can't stop this, everybody's got their own backyards, um, we're actually helping the butterfly by not planting it. The butterflies always pass through these areas, it stops in nectars, it's gonna be in your garden, I promise you that for the flowers. But to force a creature into breeding in a place that it's never bred, you need to look at the big, and just because, and again, I'm, I'm such a snarky guy, it makes us feel good because we're helping the monarch. But you're helping it by not forcing it into, migratory species have been found that if you slow them down and make them go into breeding, that's really bad for the creature. We need monarchs to move along or to hang out in the trees and please don't plant it if it's not native to but Santa Clara chapter. Y'all y'all got uh, narrow leaf milkweed, so you're good. Uh, so that's a hard one for, and you know, I'm sort of the bad guy for sitting. They're sort of changing their ideas. You have to be flexible, guys. You have to know that we're learning conservation is a rather new idea. Making your backyard a habitat is sort of new. We can't put our egos in there so much that we can't just say, oh, this isn't how it is anymore. You have to stay flexible, you have to stay current. Each butterfly has a very specific life and world and needs, as you're seeing, from the chatty guy. Okay, so that's my bully pulpit. Uh, this is a butterfly, folks, I actually just saw outside the door. This is the California ringlet. It's a tiny little grass obligate. Out of the five plants I demand for your yard, please put native grasses in, folks. Anything in the lamus, or is it limus, L-E-Y-M-U-S? Uh, and bunch grasses, great for skippers, which is a whole group at the end, and uh, the California ringlet. Really amazing story here. In the fall, when the grass is, I'm sorry, spring. <laughs> In the spring, when grass comes up, this butterfly emerges in March and April, and the first broods, the first generations of the year, are mossy green. As the broods progress, and if you go outside and look in the grass right here, the last one flying, this is the last one, there's three flights of the season, is the color of dead grass. This butterfly has co-evolved 
with the changing color of grass. Does that blow your mind, huh? And that's a really, it's a testament to the health of what's going on here in the campus, too. You don't see the California ringlet in a park on American lawn. It needs the native grasses. So please put those into your yard. It's low and it's floppy. People think it's a moth. It doesn't fly very high. It's a beautiful butterfly to paint, too. It sort of has a natural sort of watercolor to it. Okay. I got five minutes, kids. This is the green hair streak. This oh. butterfly changed my world. I had an idea for it. It strongly hilltops. Hilltopping is a phenomenon where all the boys meet at the top of the hills, the nearest hill, becomes sort of the singles bar for butterflies at about uh, three o'clock. And you're gonna see this now when you go for hikes, you're gonna hit the summit and go, wow, he's right. All this, there's a bunch of butterflies at the top of a hill. Girls go from hill to hill and have multiple partners. It's female butterflies that mix up the genetics, but the boys are dumb as spit and sit around the same hill <laughs> waiting for the last call or something. So, this boy is waiting for a girl to come by. Not all butterflies hilltop, but about 80% of ours. I swear to God, go on a hike, and the next time you'll get to the summit, and you'll go, oh my God, he's right. What are all these butterflies doing? So I had this idea. Uh, this butterfly was lost in two areas. We're flooding the neighborhood. This is the Green Hair Street Corridor. We're flooding the neighborhood in the two breeding spots, and we're handing out Ariagum latifolium, coast buckwheat, a plant before I stop here, get it in your garden. Yeah, I'm not sure you get the green hair streak, but Ackman blues and gray hair streaks. A phenomenal plant for California garden uh, because and then when the white pom-poms come up, it's a nectar magnet for all the bees and everything. Ariagnum latifolium. But she's a generalist in Ariagnum, so probably any of those Home Depot things will do. <laughs> Robert Michael Pyle is to, next to me on the right there. So this green butterfly flew with Xerxes, so I feel like we need to step up this generation. I just want to be part of a group of people that try. We want to try, because the next Dio Wilson or Jane Goodall is four years old right now, and their mom and dad are bringing them to a restoration or a native plant walk. And they'll know, they'll fix, they'll figure it out. But we just sort of need to keep the green hair streak around. Robert Michael Pyle says, it's not just the creature that it goes extinct, it's the extinction of experience. The experience of seeing a green butterfly was something all San Franciscans had, but now only a few people in the sunset have. So it's not just the creature, it's the experience of seeing the creature. That's kind of a neat way to look at it. This is the gray hair streak, this guy, we could do a whole show on him, she's doing fine, uh, has this false head. Like I said, they're bird food, fascinating thing. They can't survive the bite from the front. So see this fake antenna, see the fake eye spot, see the real antenna, see the real eye spot. And then they've taken it even further and they'll twitch their back end called scissoring. It's a misdirection to pull the bird's eye to the back and you'll see butterflies with bites out of them. That's unbelievable, right? That's the gray hair streak. Millions of dollars are spent every year to kill the gray hair streak because in the Midwest, the corn borer, she lays her eggs on ears of corn, and we don't buy ears of corn with holes in them, so it's a cosmetic thing. Oh, I did it again. Okay, so I'm power through, now we're at the blues. Like I said, the, that's the Ackman blue, the one with the orange there. Again, flowers are used. Careful with the deadheading, folks, because there really are, and, Easy on the coffee when you go out and pull out all the leaf litter. I know we all like meticulous, clean gardens, but leaf litter is extraordinarily important. If you really want to make your butterfly, your backyard, a habitat, you've got to rethink things that use the leaf litter year-round. Just leave a little around the base, because a lot of butterflies crawl in and pupate in the leaf litter, and they crawl down and they're like, this is really clean, where's the leaf litter? Uh, Echo Blue, this one dances along the canopy. You've seen this guy before. Uh, this is the female Echo Blue, just want to power it here. It's the Eastern Tailed Blue. So I am going to leave you now with the story. The guy went on a walk with me, Andy. I led a walk in uh, Earth Day. McLaren Park, 
He's a birder and he wanted to learn his butterflies, so I had a large group and I was teaching people butterflies. He works in the Presidio. He goes back to the Presidio and I get this email the next day. Liam, um, I'm probably wrong. I've got the field guide. I'm, you know, that novice, you're wrong for the first five years and then all of a sudden you're starting to get things in this new passion. And um, I got these two pictures at lunch. I had my half hour lunch and I'm looking at the book I think that's Amethula, the western tailed blue. But I'm probably wrong, right? It's like the eastern tailed blue. No, Andy, that's the western tailed blue. Not seen in 144 years in San Francisco. <laughs> and those two pictures there, Andy, are the first pictures of it in the county of San Francisco. So I really like to leave you with that story. Go, you know, they asked Lillian Gish at a retrospective of hers. Ms. Gish, what is, the, what is the key to longevity? And this little 86-year-old arthritic woman looked up and she lifted her head and she said one word, curiosity. <laughs> so be curious. Don't care if you get it wrong for the first four years. Just go out with your little cameras and your phones and show us things. And you can sort of come up with some jewels, right? Okay, and I think, oh, Western Pygmy Blue, we're gonna pretend, and then we have the skippers. Don't think about the skippers, they all, they all kind of, uh, they all use grass, so you'll be fine. Put in native grass. And don't do skippers till your fifth year or you put a luger to your head. Uh, common checkered skipper, we all know that. Fiery skipper, umber skipper. K, K, K. This is Jerry Powell, Dr. Jerry Powell. I, told, I actually discovered a new species out on uh, Yerba Buena Island. This is the rural skipper. Uh, these are some that have disappeared in San Francisco, and uh, I'm working hard to what is hanging on in this highly urbanized place has its own story. I'm helping with the Mission Blue, our only na native endangered butterfly in San Francisco. We're moving girls over. It's one of the few butterflies that uses the host plant as a lek. She waits for boys to fly by. Uh, this is in pine, dusky wing. <laughs> This is a butterfly that I caught out at Candlestick, but a lot of children were all around me. They came running up to me, I'm holding this, I knew this needed to go in the drawer at the Cal Academy of Science. And I swear to God, this little boy. You're not gonna kill it, are you, mister? <laughs> it's like 40 little faces. You're not gonna kill it, are you, mister? And I let it go. And it would never been seen in the county before. It should have been in the drawer at Cal Academy of Science. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that story. I always dedicate my show to Air Harriet Reinhardt. She was a female lepidopterist who did a lot of the work that I did from the 20s to the 80s in San Francisco. We do not have enough women in entomology. I was happy to see the bee girl there, but we need, we need to tell our little girls to get into science. And anytime I can celebrate a female lepidopterist, because trust me, it's an all white boys old man club. I like to do that. So thank you very much. Yeah.